into some financial. Today, I want to talk about one of my favorite wine region in the world, which is Champagne. We are in France. We are in the northeast part of France, more or less a couple of hundred kilometers from Paris, east of Paris, of course. Champagne is one of the northeast wine region in France, and it's one as well, one of the coldest. So first of all, a bit of uh, history and uh, why the name Champagne. So the name Champagne actually derives from the Latin word Campania. Uh, the Romans, of course, they conquer all Europe and as the most of you know, they took with them the vines from Italy. And um, when they arrived in the modern France, which at the time was called Gallia, they started to plant uh, grapes in different regions, uh, including also the one that today is Champagne. And the name Campania, or the word Campania in Latin, it means uh, countryside. And the reason why they call it so is because Champagne reminds them of the countryside of Italy. At that time, countryside of Rome was either in the north, in the modern Tuscany, or in the south, in the Campania region. And uh, the reason why Champagne reminds them of those is because of the geography of Champagne. You have a couple of uh, rivers flooding through the valleys and then undulating uh, hills, rolling hills, that reminds a lot of uh, uh, geography of other, some part of Italy. So Champagne uh, production of wine in the Champagne region started very early and continued throughout the Middle Age. Like the rest of France and the majority of other regions in Europe, the wine, wine making and the viticulture was uh, um, made by the monks. And in the region of Champagne we have several abbeys and uh, monasteries which different type of monks which then uh, uh, were, were the one helping the region to grow grapes and making it uh, produce wine for several uh, centuries. Uh, but sparkling wine in Champagne started uh, not as early as the Middle Age. It started later in a later point. We will talk more about that. So before that uh, the region was uh, renowned for their sparkling wines, the region actually was uh, renowned for their pale red wines or even uh, uh, cloudy rosé wines. They were as renowned as often they were used actually to be served for the coronation of French kings. And the reason is because in the Cathedral of Reims it was uh, common to crown the new kings of France. So of course uh, they were drinking wine from the region. So from the Reims region, which is today maybe the capital of Champagne. Uh, prior to 1600, actually, there isn't any references to the Champagne region, but there is more references to the different villages of Champagne, such as Epargne, Ai, Rem, and so on. And today, in the, uh, in the folklore of people, Champagne was created by maybe the most uh, mythological and legendary figure of the Champagne history, which is uh, Dom Perignon. So who was Dom Perignon? Dom Perignon was a, a monk was a hobby that uh, um, is estimated that he was born around 1639. Um, when he was 18 he entered the Benedictine order and at the age of around 29, so in 1668, he became the cellarer of the uh, Abbey of Hautevillers, which is a Abbey on the other side of the river uh, uh, Marne compared to Epernay, so it's in the heart of Champagne and is on uh, what is uh, uh, known today as the Valle de la Marne or anyway it's in the close by the village of Ai in uh, Champagne. So he, was, uh, he became the cellarer at uh, the, um, the Abbey of Hautevillers in uh, 1668 and then he kept this role until uh, he died. It was after the, after the uh, head monk of the monastery, he was the most important monk at the Abbey. Um, what we know about uh, Dom Perignon is actually not directly from him, but is from his uh, successor and disciple, which wrote uh, uh, about his mentor and master. Um, we don't have anything written from uh, Dom Perignon itself, but all the information that we get uh, regarding Dom Perignon comes from later. Uh, time points. So his successor and developer uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, and the new seller uh, master at uh, Otvier uh, Habi, he uh, wrote about his, uh, his mentor and he wrote about how important he was for the viticulture, for the techniques, for the pruning, for the uh, work in the vineyard and uh, last but not least for the uh, blending and for the uh, clarification of the wine. 
prior Dom Perignon, the majority of the wine were quite cloudy and um, the blending of different uh, uh, wines, colors and uh, from different uh, parcels wasn't that common in the region. Thanks to Dom Perignon, it became common. But the, the Savoli didn't write anything about sparkling wine. So even though in the uh, legend uh, and in the popular folklore we have Dom Perignon as the figure that created sparkling wine in Champagne, it might not be true. The first uh, reference of Dom Perignon being the creator of sparkling wine comes from a letter that uh, um, seller at uh, the Abbey of Fort Villiers called Dom Gossard uh, wrote uh, to the mayor of Rheims in 1821. So we are talking almost uh, 140 years after that, uh, or even more actually, 160 years almost after that Dom Perignon itself worked at the Abbey. And in this letter he prose the uh, the work of Dom Perignon and he said that it's thanks to Dom Perignon that sparkling wine production started in Champagne. This is uh, not that likely that was uh, 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 the reality, maybe it was just a, a way to praise uh, a brother from the same order and uh, to put him as the creator of Champagne. Um, the evidence show actually that uh, the inventor of modern uh, champagne, or at least the inventor of uh, sparkling champagne, uh, we have to uh, research it in Great Britain, we have to research it in England. Uh, and the reason is because uh, from a document from the Royal Society dated 1662, it described a very common technique used in uh, England, which was to add to barrels of wine, especially wine from Champagne, but also from other regions, but mainly from Champagne, to add uh, uh, molasses or other type of sugar or sweetening to create a, a brisk effect to the wine or a sparkling effect to the wine. Um, other evidences point out that uh, 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 England had a better uh, starting point when it comes to possibly uh, producing a bottle of sparkling wine due to the uh, technology that England was uh, having when it comes to glass and bottles and um, uh, cork. So in, in this period, in the end of the, of, the, uh, of the 17th century, so in the end of 1600, uh, England had a much higher technology when it comes to glass than France. And the reason is because France was still doing glass by wood fire, while England was doing it with coal fire. The difference is that coal fire is a higher temperature, so produces a stronger glass that could actually uh, kept inside the sparkling wine, which, as you know, has a quite high pressure inside and quite high atmosphere, so needs a stronger glass too. Uh, keep um, while well, the French glass was quite light and thin. Another reason is because uh, England was uh, already using cork, while French was still use uh, uh, wood wrapped in hemp. So then it was much more difficult for those type of uh, stopper to to keep the bubbles and to keep the CO two in the bottle. Uh, it is most likely that it's around the 18th century, the beginning of the 18th century, that the sparkling wine in a way comes to Champagne. Uh, and uh, and uh, started to be produced in what is now called Champagne. Um, a proof is that uh, in 1728 uh, a royal decree uh, passed and the decree allowed uh, that the wine could be transported not only in barrels like it was until like, 1728 but was allowed to be transported in bottles as well. And strangely enough, or maybe not that strangely, the petition to start this decree or to uh, create this decree started and was uh, um, written in Rennes, so in the capital of Champagne. Another evidence is that in 1729 we have the foundation of the first house uh, producing only sparkling wine in Champagne, which was Maison Ruinard, or which is Maison Ruinard, um, as a result of this royal decree. So this is a no surprise. More further evidence uh, that shows how quick uh, champagne grows uh, as, uh, um, as, a, as a product uh, in uh, not only in internal market but also international market is that we have uh, documents of Veve Clicquot uh, exporting uh, champagne uh, to other part of the world. In seven, we have a document from 1782 that shows that uh, Veve Clicquot was exporting to Philadelphia and uh, we have a document from 1789 that shows how popular champagne was in the upper class in the in US, or in, at that time it wasn't US, but uh, in the American colonies, by having uh, this document that shows that uh, George Washington 
uh, George Washington uh, bought 24 bottles of champagne for his own cellar. Uh, in 1830, we have uh, the starting of production of what is now called vintage champagne. We will see more about that afterwards. And, uh, 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 but it wasn't until around 1870 that it became popular to produce vintage champagne. Uh, some more dates. In 1904, we have the creation of the Syndicat Viticole, uh, Federation de Syndicat Viticole. It was a body that was supposed to overlook over fraud. Uh, in the Champagne region, and uh, in 1908 we have a quite important uh, uh, law uh, that passed, uh, the, uh, that was accepted and passed, uh, and uh, that was setting boundaries for the Champagne region. Uh, in the regional law of the 1908, uh, the Haube region, which we'll see afterwards, uh, was completely excluded. It's a big region on the south part of Champagne, and was completely excluded. Uh, and uh, until in the period between 1908 and 1911, uh, the, this law was uh, was used, and then in 1911 was passed a bill that uh, uh, stipulated that the word champagne on a bottle was supposed uh, to contain only grapes from the regions accepted in the law of 1908, so only uh, grapes from the champagne region. So that again excluded, of course, uh, Elbe, since it wasn't there. So grapes from the Elbe region, which were usually used to produce the sparkling wine, also in the north, um, they were supposed to be bottled as a normal sparkling wine and in a different facilities. So this bill led to growers from the Elbe region, which suddenly were out of work, basically. They, um, they started some demonstrations, and the result of this demonstration was a bill from the Senate, um, from the French Senate, which, suppose, which proposed to overrun and uh, do a new wine law or a new law from the 1908. So to include, in a way, Elbe in the law. This was, of course, uh, not very well uh, taken by the growers of the north, so of the uh, Valais de la Man region, and it, it became such a big uh, riot that actually there were uh, um, people that were killed, there were wineries that were uh, uh, raised and, uh, and so on. So it was a big, big uh, riot in Champagne in 1911, which led to, uh, uh, in the end, a law where everybody in a way was happy in 1927, which included Elbe in the Champagne appellation, but included it as a deuxième zone or second zone. So as a kind of small brother or little brother of the other regions. It kept like this until 1936, that was the year from when INAO, the, um, uh, the Institut National de la Appellation d'Origine in France, INAO created the Champagne House as we know it today, so including both Alba and, of course, other regions in the north, without distinction between uh, Premier Zone and Deuxième Zone. Uh, another important uh, uh, instrument that was created in 1911 is what is called the Echelle de Cru. I showed the crew, uh, it was a, uh, a way to, in a way, classify the uh, kind of classification form used in Champagne until 2010. So basically, the Shell crew was meant to formalize the uh, price, the grape price per kilo, and was dividing uh, the villages in different categories. So we had, uh, uh, when the Shell crew was used, we had uh, 17 villages which were rated 100% which are the ones that are known as Grand Cru. And then there were 42 villages uh, rated between 90 and 99%, which are the ones known as Premier Cru. And then we had all the other villages between 80 and uh, 89%, which could have been used the word Deuxième Cru, but the majority of the situation, they just use a champagne on the label. Uh, but what does it mean, those percentage? These were the price, the percentage of price per kilo per grapes that the growers could expect or could get paid uh, for their grapes, according to the classification. So if you were a Grand Cru, you were paid 100%, and if you were a Dezim Cru, you were paid according to the range of your village, so between 80 and 89%. As I said, in 2010, actually Cru uh, fell out, so nobody is not used anymore, even though, of course, the word Grand Cru and Premier Cru is still used for the villages which were classified Grand Cru and Premier Cru, uh, in 2010. So you can still find, of course, uh, your uh, Messini Sorocher Grand Cru, for example. Uh, in, uh, in the 20th century, after uh, 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 this um, uh, uh, 
period of uh, of uh, uh, doing a Chalet Cru and uh, creating the champagne. I would say there was a big focus uh, also on site-specific champagne. And it all started actually already in 1935 with the first single wire champagne produced, which was uh, the Clos de Guasse from uh, the uh, Champagne House known as Philippe Poma. Um, it was until the end of the 20th century, honestly, that uh, <coughs> took over this uh, specific site. But there are some pioneers, so on again, uh, Claude Guasse from Philippe Ponat in 1935, or in 1952, uh, Catier with uh, his Claude Molen, followed by uh, Pierre Petter with his Chetillon in 1971, Grand Cendré from Drapier in 1975, and finally, maybe the most one of the most iconic single vine champagne known today, which is Krug Claude Mesnil in 1979. In the period between 1979 and the middle of the 90s, there were as well some more. Uh, uh, single wired uh, coming out, so for like, uh, uh, for example, Cure Louis from Tarlante or Terre de Noël from Jean Milan or Claude de Notre Dame from uh, Forni, but it was actually in 1995 that really took over the specific site. In 1995, we got a lot of different uh, houses uh, uh, producing single wired for the first time. The most famous, of course, uh, are uh, Krug, which is Claude Ambonnet, and uh, Claude Saint Hilaire from Billecart. Salmon. Since the uh, end of uh, the 90s and uh, the new century, we have uh, also a new wave of a specific site, maybe even from uh, more peripheric uh, um, appellations or more peripheric uh, areas of the Champagne region. An example is Le Beguin, uh, uh, which was produced for the first time in 1998 from Jérôme Prévost, which comes from the uh, uh, northwest part of the Vallée de la Marne. Uh, or, for example, Cédric Bouchard with his Ursul from the 2000 vintage, and in 2006, Charton Taillet, as well uh, from the north part of the Montagne de Rheim, which produced for the first time Le Bar, which is a champagne made with ungrafted vine, it's quite unique for the area, and uh, in the south, Marie Courten with uh, the production of Resonance et Eloquence for the first time in 2006. So this is a, a brief history of Champagne. I thought it's quite important to know where we are before that we start to actually talk about the region and talk about grapes and talk about the styles and so on. But now enough of the story, I would say. Let's uh, start to dig in the actually um, Champagne itself. So first of all, uh, uh, the, the raw material. So Champagne, uh, we have three main grapes in Champagne. Uh, one white, which is Chardonnay, and the two red, which are Pinot Meunier and Pinot Noir. Uh, beside that, uh, we have four other grapes which are allowed, which are not maybe that popular, but they are coming back for... Uh, a lot of producers are looking more and more into those grapes, and we will see later why. So the four other grapes allowed in Champagne are Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, which is known as well as a Fromenteau, Petit Meslier and Arban grape. Uh, Champagne, we have uh, seven areas, five main areas, or at least most known areas, and two smaller. So the three main uh, areas, like the three main grapes, are Cote Blanc, which focus mainly on Chardonnay grape, Montagne de Rheim, which focus mainly on Pinot Noir, and Valle de la Marne, which focus mainly on uh, Pinot Meunier. And these three regions, as, as well as three main, three capital or three main cities, we have, of course, Epernay in uh, Cote Blanc, Aïe, which I mentioned before as a, uh, in, uh, close by the Hot Vieira Bay for in Valle de la Marne, and of course Montagne de Rheim, as the name suggests, Rheim. Beside that, we have uh, two other regions. We have Cote de which lies south of uh, Cote de Blanc, which as well is focused on Chardonnay. And then far south, the region which uh, uh, created in a way the riots of the 1911, which is Helbe, which is the area around Troyes. Helbe is a bit special because it's closer to Chablis, than it is actually to Cote Blanc. So it's quite a, a long drive from Haube to uh, Cote Blanc. Uh, and Haube, since it's a, a southern, it's also a bit warmer climate, so it's mainly focuses on Pinot Noir grape. Beside that, two smaller regions, uh, such as the Massif Saint Thierry and Valle de Laslo, which are as, as well uh, in the north uh, uh, bank of the Marne River and uh, west of uh, uh, Rennes, Montagne de Rennes. The, the Grand Cru, the 17 Grand Cru that I spoke about before, they are concentrated in the triangle between Epernay, Ai and Rheims, so in the, three main, in the three main region. We have six Grand Cru in Cote Blanc, two Grand Cru in Valle de la Marne, and 11 
sorry, and nine, <laughs> my maths is wrong, and nine Grand Cru in Montagne de Rennes. And when it comes to uh, terrain and soils, mainly we can find the chalk soil in the three main regions, in Valle de la Marne, Montagne de Rennes, and uh, uh, Cote Blanc. And while uh, in the south, in Aube, we have uh, uh, mainly Kimme region uh, clay, since it's again closer to Chablis than it is actually to the north part of Champagne. And the chalk is quite special, the chalk in, uh, uh, it's a really white stone in the, in the north part of Champagne. And if you go to Rem, the city itself is built on a, uh, on a plateau of chalk. And uh, maybe not everybody knows that, but below the level, the ground level of Rem, there is thousands of kilometers of, uh, of tunnel and of galleries that were, uh, that were uh, uh, excavated in the, uh, in the chalk. And all the chalk, you can see, if you go to the Rems Cathedral, the chalk that is used to build the uh, Cathedral of Rems comes actually from the uh, Crayer, which were the cave uh, or the quarries uh, from where the chalk was uh, uh, collected. The region uh, includes uh, three AOC, so three appellation. We have, of course, uh, uh, the Champagne appellation, which covers all the sparkling wines uh, of different colors, white and rosé. We'll see more about that afterwards. And then we have the Coteau Champenois uh, appellation, which is an appellation which is gaining more popularity again, but we'll talk more about that afterwards. And uh, it's an appellation for steel wine, white or red, from the uh, Champagne region. And uh, the third appellation is the Rosé, Rosé de Risey, which is uh, an appellation for Rosé wine from the Risey village in the Aube region, which is produced by uh, uh, maceration on the skin and only in the Risey village. Uh, a bit of the um, process making of champagne, or what is called the méthode traditionnelle or méthode champenois, so the traditional method. Uh, first of all, uh, it's quite important to know, to understand that uh, from its it's very small, uh, the, the, uh, the extraction that you get from grapes in Champagne. So from 4,000 kilos of grapes, you can extract 2,550 liters. Of these uh, 500 liters, they are discarded or they are used, for example, for distillation, and they are called the taille. And so of these are used only 2,050 liters out of 4,000 kilos. It's quite a, it's quite a big, uh, big difference. Uh, and uh, these 2050 liters, they are called uh, cuvée or vin de cuvée. And of course, the first juice coming from the first press uh, is the highest quality. So sometimes, or a lot of times, the uh, top producer use this first juice to produce the, their top champagne. Uh, if you go through the process uh, in a, uh, uh, from the beginning, in a way, so we have the harvest, of course. So you harvest uh, the grapes, uh, it depends from house to house, you can harvest it uh, either by parcel or maybe you can just uh, put all together, but the majority of course are harvested parcel by parcel. And then you produce a, a base wine, which is called the Vin Clair. Um, so again, from uh, you press out these 2050 liters and it's only from that that you produce the Vin Clair. Uh, it's a base wine, it's a quite a neutral wine in a way, of course, now uh, with a more warmer climate you produce more aromatic and expressive Vin Clair. But historically it's a quite uh, neutral wine, low in alcohol, 10 to 11 percent, quite high in acidity. It depends on the, on the style of the house, so you can age this Vin Clair either in stainless steel or you can age it in barrels, or you can age it, for example, um, uh, you can have the malolactic fermentation going on, or you can uh, have it without malolactic fermentation. It depends on the style. After that, uh, it comes a very important, uh, a very important uh, uh, process, which is called the blend, and which create uh, historically the figure of the blender or the master blender in Champagne. So it's a quite uh, um, uh, long and uh, uh, difficult process. The blending, uh, basically, the master blend tastes all the barrels or the containers or the vats that the producer has. So they are all uh, tasted individually and then uh, you start to blend the different, uh, uh, the different batches. Um, and sometimes you have as much as three, four, five hundred different uh, batches. It depends on uh, the amount of parcel that you own. Um, I, I can say that I, I did something like that, uh, not for champagne, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm not a master blender in Champagne, but I did something like that for uh, cider since I live close to Adanger. Uh, so I did something like that with a, with a cider producer that I worked together with, which is called Edel Cider. Uh, I did something like that uh, to produce a special cider for Parc Hotel, which is called Cuvée Parc. 
Um, and last time that I did it was now in January this year, and uh, I had in front of me 14 different, 15, sorry, 15 different batches or 15 different vats. Uh, and I can say that with 15 already is not an easy task, so I can't imagine how it is with 500. It's a quite uh, uh, difficult job which uh, needs a lot of uh, time to do it. And that's why the refigure of the Master Blender, because they are quite uh, highly professional, uh, really um, focusing on uh, this part of the process, which is really important. Because from this one, you create the blend for that veneer or for that uh, um, specific cuvette, which uh, also has to reflect the style of the house. So after that the blend is finished, you bottle, uh, you bottle this blend uh, and then uh, you go through the uh, prise de mousse uh, process or secondary fermentation. To do so, to the bottle you add a mix, the, what is called a liqueur de tirage, which is a mixture of unfermented uh, wine, so unfermented grape juice, um, sugar and yeast, and then uh, you close uh, the uh, bottle. When it comes to close the bottle, it depends, there are different philosophy. Uh, historically, you use a normally crown cap, the one that you can find on sodas. But lately, some producers, especially smaller producers, start to use a natural cork to uh, close the bottle because then the, this, the process of the second fermentation and the aging after that might be quite long. And uh, use, by using natural uh, uh, cork, you might maybe lose some uh, pressure, some bubble that you don't do that with a crown cap, but you might get also some more complexity. So again, it depends from the house of the producer. So, Prince de Mousse, uh, uh, you add the liqueur de tirage and then you close the bottle and then it starts the second fermentation because natur naturally the yeast uh, will eat the sugar in the unfermented uh, uh, juice and, uh, and, uh, and, and we produce as a byproduct the CO2, which then re remain uh, encapsulated in the bottle since it's closed. Uh, so after this process is done, uh, it varies between a couple of weeks to up to three months. After that, the second fermentation is uh, finished, uh, you have the period which is called mise sur latte, or aging on the lease. And this is a quite important uh, uh, period for champagne because it's when you leave basically the bottle lying on the fine lease, uh, which are uh, basically the dead yeast uh, cells. Uh, and you leave it there for a period that is at least 15 months for the non-vintage or at least 36 months for the vintage champagne up to several years, depending again from the cuvée and from the style, style of the house. And uh, what happens in this period is what is called autolysis. Autolysis, autolysis, sorry. Autolysis, it's an uh, enzymatic uh, process. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's the enzymatic breakdown of this uh, dead uh, yeast cellar, which release uh, molecules uh, which uh, increase the complexity and gives aroma to the wine. So the, the, the famous uh, uh, benchmark aromas that you can find in Champagne, like brioche or uh, uh, bread crust or uh, yeast or the croissant, this type of aromas, they come from the autolysis uh, uh, process. Once that you finish with this process, or once that uh, you, uh, you reach the point as a, as a champagne producer that you want to reach with your autolysis, uh, you uh, go through the process called uh, reading in English or mise sur point or remouage in French. So basically it's the uh, very iconic process of these uh, uh, men in the cave which are turning the bottles gradually until it goes from a horizontal position to a vertical position. Uh, historically, were these men doing it, and there was a study showing that the uh, average work life of, uh, of, uh, of a person in charge of the remouage was around 20 to 25 million bottles during a lifetime of turning. So I guess that we get a lot of uh, uh, inflammation to, to the joints. But um, today, fortunately, we have a machine to do that, and we have a special machine called the Giro Palette, which in decreases the time of this process and uh, uh, speed up the process as well. So once that the bottle is vertical, once that we have uh, uh, the bottle on a vertical position, of course, by gravity, this sediment, which is natural in the bottle, flew down to the neck of the bottle. So you have uh, in, the, in the end of the neck, you have a clump of uh, uh, sediment. Once that we reach this point, so once that the bottle is a sewer point, we, uh, we do through the degorgement 
or the degorging process. So there are two ways to do it. The modern way is uh, to do the degorgement à la glace or the icing uh, degorging. So basically you take the bottles, again, there is a machine for that, but the bottles are taken and then they are deep. The neck of the bottle is deep in liquid nitrogen that will freeze then the, uh, the end of the neck where the sediment is, so create a clump of ice and uh, sediment. And then once it is frozen in a, with a special machine, you open it, the pressure inside the bottle will push out uh, this clump and then uh, you, uh, uh, you, you refill the bottle in a way uh, with something with, with later. later. Uh, so then, uh, uh, so in this way the sediment is out. Uh, and this is the new way. The traditional way is called uh, the gorging uh, uh, à la volée or the gorgement à la volée. Uh, so basically, once that the bottle is uh, sur point, manually you take the bottle Gradually, you turn it in uh, almost uh, uh, a vertical position, almost up to 30, 35 degrees neck up, up. Uh, but has to be very gentle movement so that the sediment will not fall down again in the uh, bottle. And then you have a special, uh, uh, a special uh, instrument to open it. And again, the sediment is pushed out by the uh, pressure in the bottle. In this way, you can clarify the wines by uh, removing the sediment. Mm. The most common process, of course, today is uh, the uh, degorging uh, à la glace. Once that you, once that you uh, have degorged the, the wine, you have, of course, you might lose some wine in the process, and uh, you have, of course, uh, to um, uh, top up the bottles. And you do it often with what is called the liqueur d'expédition. Um, or the dosage process. So dosage is because we have different style of champagne which we'll see afterwards. You can uh, at this point decide in which style you want to have your champagne. So you add uh, um, a mix of uh, usually unfermented grape juice or other sweetening to decide which dosage you want in your uh, champagne. And then after that, of course, you put the cork, you put the habillage or mousselet, which is the cage around the cork and keeps the cork uh, in and then of course the foil and the labels and then it's out uh, ready to be shipped out in the market. So this is a, a process of the traditional method. Uh, if you remember I said that we have the liquor de dosage so we uh, 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 do the dosage in the end and that's because the champagne can be produced in different styles. So we have uh, from a, a really uh, dry style which has uh, no dosage at all uh, uh, up to a sweet style. So the, the, the style which has no dosage at all, which is the driest style, is called Brut Nature or Zero Dosage. Uh, so here we don't have any liquor de dosage. After that we have the Extra Brut style, which is uh, uh, slightly uh, level of dosage, but quite, quite dry and quite uh, uh, in style. And then we have the most common style, which is the Brut, which you can include up to 12 uh, gram per liter of residual sugar, which is the most common style of champagne. After Brut, uh, we go to uh, Extra Sec, and then we have the Sec, and then we have the Demi Sec, and in the end we have the Du, which is the sweetest, which includes more than 50, uh, 52 grams per liter in uh, the finished uh, product. Um, like you have different styles when it comes to dosage, we have also different styles of the champagne itself. Champagne can be produced basically in three uh, styles. So we have uh, uh, the style Blanc de Blanc, uh, which includes only white grapes in the, in the process. So we have mainly the Blanc de Blanc are made only with Chardonnay, but now that uh, uh, other grapes like uh, Pinot Blanc or Arban are getting more popular, we start to see also blend of those grapes with the Chardonnay. Um, so in a Blanc de Blanc you find only white grape. In a Blanc de Noir you find only red grapes. Uh, it could be a hundred percent of one type of red, so either Pinot Meunier or Pinot Noir, or uh, it can be blended of Pinot Meunier and Pinot Noir. Uh, and uh, uh, it's important to remember that the Blanc de Noir is as well usually white in color. Uh, or at least a very, very, very pale pink. And that's because uh, uh, it, those red grapes are vinified in white. Uh, mainly. Uh, and the third category is the Rosé Champagne. Rosé Champagne can be produced in uh, two ways. We have the traditional way, which is uh, the uh, uh, Sagné way. So you have the maceration um, 
a short maceration uh, period to extract color. So again, mainly the Rosé de Sagnat is made, of course, with uh, uh, red grapes, because you have to extract the color from the grapes. Or you have the blend. Uh, Champagne is the only appellation in Europe where it is actually allowed to blend white and red wine to produce a rosé. All the other rosé in uh, uh, Europe are produced by red grapes or anyway by extraction, by maceration. Uh, in Champagne you can blend white and red. So you can, uh, you can have a rosé champagne which has, uh, for example, 90% of white wine and 10% of red wine just to give the rosé color. Or the opposite, where you have 90% red wine and 10% uh, uh, white wine, even though it's very <laughs> unlikely, but it is a possibility. Um, so this is a, a bit of this uh, uh, regarding the style of uh, champagne and uh, uh, production and so. Uh, historically, we have uh, two types of producer in the Champagne region. Uh, it's important to talk a bit about uh, the, uh, the producer themselves. Uh, we have two styles. The one that in a way started uh, Champagne, uh, like Maison Ruinart or Veuve Clicquot or Moët Chandon or so on, uh, they are in the category known as Negociant. Uh, Negociant, they are the majority of the big houses are Negociant because Negociant is a producer which uh, source grapes from growers beside uh, eventually grapes that he owns on, uh, via the, that he owns on his own. So uh, a negociant doesn't mean necessarily that buys all the grapes, they might have, and the majority of them actually, they do have vineyard that they own themselves, but they um, uh, surrogate the grapes from those vineyards with grapes that they buy from other growers. Um, so that's a negociant. Another, the other category, which are the majority of the small producer, they are called growers, uh, it's called growers, uh, grower champagne, and they are uh, uh, producers that produce grapes only from uh, um, grapes that they grown on their own fire. So they don't buy grapes from other producers or from other growers. Uh, what is a bit uh, special in a way in the, in, the, in the rules that states in Champagne is that if you are a grower, you can apply and ask a license to be a negociant if you want to sell to buy grapes from your neighbor, for example. Uh, so this process is possible to do it, but if you are a negociant, you cannot, in a way, cancel your license and go back to grower. So if once that uh, a grower decide to go to, the, to get the negociant license, you can't go back in a way. If you want to go back to grower status, then you have to start a new company. And that, of course, it's unfortunately for the majority of the uh, of the hold houses in Champagne, because or even or all producers even, because maybe they have a, a long tradition or long history, several generations, and that build the brand. So they don't want to start from scratch all over again to go back to um, the grow status. Even though maybe they have a stop by grapes from other, they still keep the negotiant status. Mm. Uh, in the end, since the end of the 20th century, the growers, uh, uh, producer, they um, uh, in a way come under the spotlight, they, come, they became more and more popular uh, wines from these producers. Uh, maybe the pioneer and the trailblazer was uh, one of the most famous uh, producers in Champagne and actually maybe uh, as a grower Champagne the most famous, which is Anselm Selos. Uh, even though actually, ironically enough, now he uh, went to the negociant category because uh, he started as a negociant from la since last year, but uh, he was the one that in the end, uh, in the 90s, uh, in a way, were put under the spotlight, the, grow the category of growers champagne. Um, and they are quite, it's a quite unique category, uh, if you ask me. I, 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 I myself uh, uh, am a big fan of grower champagne. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the of the of how unique are the uh, the champagne producer from this grower. How uh, you diverse they are. How uh, uh, exciting they are. It's possible to find uh, several expression of the same village. So it's it's not a standardized product, which sometimes might be from bigger producer. But I think it's important here to remember something that. Champagne, as we know today, is, is a brand that has been built for several years. Uh, it's 300 years of history, and in a way, the, the point that we are now, when it comes to the market, uh, when it comes to the brand Champagne, is also thanks to these big houses, which even though maybe they might be more 
uh, standard and, uh, and consequent than Grover Champagne, which might have a huge variation from one vintage to the other when it comes to the style. Uh, so maybe it's not that it's less interesting, but it's more predictable what they produce. Anyway, they need to, at least for me, they have the respect for what they did for the region and for what they did for the brand. Uh, so as all, uh, even though my personal preferences might be towards uh, uh, Grove Champagne, that doesn't mean that I believe that the big houses are bad because they have been quite important for the region as a whole. Um, and here we comes to uh, why I love Champagne. Um, I, 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 I love the diversity of Champagne, I love how multifacial Champagne is. It's, it's really a beverage that you can have it from the start of a meal to the end of a meal. You can start, it, start with it as an aperitif and you can uh, have it uh, all the way through the dessert. You can, uh, uh, you, can have, you can drink it when it's younger, you can age it, you can drink it when it's old, you can, uh, you can drink it with food, you can drink it alone. It's really, it's really an exciting product and uh, it really is uh, an exciting uh, uh, wine to work with and an exciting wine to pair food with. I'm actually a uh, so big fan of Champagne and how uh, uh, interesting and exciting it is to um, pair it with food that actually I, uh, I do at the park, for example, I, uh, special evenings only with Champagne and food. So that, that shows how really I uh, believe that Champagne is uh, uh, something that not a lot of people think about as a food wine, but it is, it is actually. Uh, one of my best uh, wine pairing ever in my career has been uh, when I tasted a rosé champagne with a main course based on pork. So that shows how uh, important and how um, exciting is the possibility to pair it. Um, so where where the champagne is going now? Uh, uh, now champagne is uh, uh, I I believe at least uh, that is uh, having a new revival. Uh, uh, of course, the champagne has always been a, a status a symbol. Or you always have uh, uh, in a way when you think champagne, you think party, you think special occasion, uh, and it is of course. But uh, I believe that is uh, uh, is having a revival, especially in the professionals and uh, for us sommeliers, due to those. Uh, uh, rising uh, producer, up, uh, up and coming uh, stars. Uh, we mentioned some of them before: uh, uh, Cédric Bouchard, uh, mm, Prevost, uh, and uh, Marie Courten uh, for 10, 15, 20 years ago. And now there is a new range of uh, younger producer uh, coming up, which are really creating uh, exciting products. And for us professionals, are uh, really, really uh, uh, putting more attention to the region, which we as a professional might have in a way forgot a bit when it comes or at least categorized only as a um, uh, aperity for a festivity uh, region. Uh, another a very very exciting uh, uh, thing going on in Champagne right now which is getting more and more popular and which we will see more and more in the market so look out for it is the uh, are the Coteau Champenois wine so the still wine from Champagne and from uh, from the Champagne region, both white and red. Uh, the reason is basically because we had in the last uh, few years so, uh, a quite uh, um, big climate change in the world, of course, but not only that, in the, when it comes to Champagne, the, the temperature rose and uh, each year, the last uh, four or five years has been earlier and earlier the harvest, uh, new record here, new record there. And, uh, and, and they are actually producing grapes which are mature enough to produce high quality steel wine. One of the reasons why Champagne maybe focused uh, uh, on uh, sparkling wine was because if you remember when I talked about the Van Clare, I said that they were quite neutral, low in alcohol, acidic, uh, not unbalanced, but quite neutral and uh, mainly would focus on acidity. So uh, thanks to this uh, new, in a way, climate, on the, uh, or thanks to the new possibility to have uh, riper grapes, a lot of producers are start to focusing also on Coteau Champenois. In the old days, maybe Coteau Champenois was uh, the, in a way, you were producing it when the grapes were not good enough to do Champagne. Now you have no, more and more producers which are focusing, for example, only on Coteau Champenois. So they do not produce Champagne yet, 
but they do produce Cotosian pinwheels because maybe they are just young or just started. So really, really exciting uh, uh, products, uh, really, really exciting wines. We will see more of that. There is a huge potential for Pinot Noir in the south, in the Elbe region, uh, since it's warmer and there's a, um, a different, a bit more clay rich soil. Uh, but as well, the Chardonnay from the north with the chalk will, might be really, really exciting. Uh, maybe one small drawback, at least for now, uh, is that uh, even though the products are exciting uh, and the wines are exciting, since they come from the Champagne region, the price do reflect a bit the price that you can buy a Champagne for. So that might be a drawback, because even though our exciting wine, maybe the quality is not yet there to... Uh, justify the price of those wines but i'm pretty sure that uh, we will hear more and more about that and that, that will be a more and more present on the market and it will be really exciting to see where this go especially now that uh, uh, another region producing chardonnay pinot noir burgundy is getting uh, the prices and uh, recommending the prices which they are they are now so that it will be exciting to see how a competitor to burgundy possibly will uh, affect that so that's uh, my take on champagne uh, as i said in the beginning when i started this uh, channel i will i'm i'm not here to tell you taste this champagne or taste that champagne i'm uh, I, I want to present the region i want to present uh, the history i want to present the techniques and i want to present the uh, trends and the styles but it's up to you guys to find a good champagne to have in your glass and to uh, judge yourself which is the style that you prefer but of course if you have uh, if you uh, are interested to know my uh, my personal preferences when it comes to champagne just uh, drop a comment uh, on the uh, on the commentary fell and I will uh, I will try to try my best to give you my my personal uh, uh, preferences so for now for today uh, I'll say thank you